You know, if you think about it, that song is very much about what we've been talking about. As I listen to the words, um, this, the first verse caught me off just at the beginning. I know who I am because I know who you are. That's good. The cross of salvation is only the start. I've known some people who say, oh, horrors. You're trying to add something to the cross. That's the finished work of Jesus. Yes, it is. But it's the finished work of the work that will never be finished. In Jesus, in an instant, we have total and complete salvation. That we're going to be living from glory to glory to greater and greater degrees forever and ever. You've heard me say it, you'll never be more alive than the day you were born. But wouldn't it be terrible if that's all the life you experienced? So even though birth is a finished work, you're born. You're not half born, you're not a quarter born, you're not almost born. When you're born, you're born, amen? You're alive. And even though that's the end of a finished work, it's the beginning of something that's going to go on forever. You'll never be more married than the day you got married. But woe be, that was all the marriage you experienced. No, you're fully married. That's a finished work. But that finish is the beginning of a life together. Does that make sense? And it's the same with Jesus. When he gives us salvation, that's in a moment, and that's a finished work. He did it on the cross. He made it available. I can receive it. But wouldn't it be sad if that's all the life I experienced? No, no, no. That finished work is the beginning of not only transformation here, but we're going to be becoming more and more like Jesus throughout eternity. Before, when Jesus comes, the negative will all be gone. The positive will will have just begun. Does that make sense? So I kind of got into the words of that song to, uh, it, it really fits what we've been talking about. Let's pray. Jesus, as we open your word today, show us again what you have for us through the power of your spirit, we pray. Amen. So Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's a dying so that you can be born again, and that's the beginning, that finished beginning, which is the beginning of something that will never be finished because it will be better and better throughout eternity. Present yourselves, your bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. We not, may not be holy, we may not be well-pleasing, but when we are the sacrifice, that's holy and well-pleasing to him. Which is your logical service, literally. And the word service refers only to serving God, so it is your logical service to God. We've said it many times, let's say it one more time. Logically, the only thing you can bring to someone who has everything is yourself. Because that's the one thing he doesn't have and he wants more than anything else, and he emptied heaven to get it. So Paul says, your logical worship of God, how you serve him, you can bring him your money, he can, he can make money. <laughs> he can manufacture gold. You can bring him time, he can make time. But there'll never be another you. Every human being is unique, child of God. So don't be conformed to this world. Don't let the world scrunch you into its mold. It's an outward inward. But be transformed. That's an inward outward, which means the growth can go on forever. By the renewing of your mind, it starts on the inside. We talked about the idea of the living sacrifice, the, the death to the old. Our old nature roots grow a twisted tree, our character. That has to be cut off. That's death. But that death leads to the graft, into the living rootstock of Jesus. And if we abide in that graft, he will, re, he will transform our twisted tree from the inside out, little by little at the speed of life, from glory to glory. 
And he'll not only root out all the negative stuff, but he'll keep that positive growth going forever. So don't be scrunched down by the world, but be transformed, um, expanded through the renewing of your mind. He always starts on the inside. And now my own translation that you may prove what the will of God is. What will God's will look like if you let him work it out in your life? And I think we're all afraid of what he might do, what he might not let us do that we want to do, or where he might take us that we didn't have in mind, or, or, or where he might not let us go that we wanted to go. But Paul says, if you will let God transform you from the inside out, die to the old, be grafted into the new, your life is going to become living proof of the will of God, that it's good. And that's not good behavior. That's good to the core, to the heart. And if you've got a good heart, good stuff comes out, right? You can fake good stuff with a bad heart, but eventually the bad heart comes out and messes it all up. But he'll make it good to the core. Well-pleasing, not just acceptable, but well-pleasing. We will become well-pleasing. We're not even well-pleasing to ourselves. How can we be well-pleasing to God? He can do that and complete. Our big fear is that we're going to be found incomplete. What do I lack? For I say, through the grace given to me, Paul is speaking here to everyone who is among you, so he's speaking to all of us, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, literally not to be hyper-minded. And I think what Paul is saying here is that God is going to do such an amazing thing in your life, making you good, well-pleasing, and complete, that Satan is going to turn his temptations into a different angle and try to get you to do the same thing he did, and that is start thinking, you're pretty good and fabulous. That's what happened to Lucifer in heaven got stuck on himself. God gave him that incredible beauty. God gave him those incredible talents. And he decided it was all him and he should be God. And when God begins to make us all that he wants to make us, Satan will try to get us to think it's really us and we're pretty spectacular. Sometimes I think that's why God grows us so slowly because he knows if he makes us too wonderful too soon, we'll get stuck on ourselves. He's got to get the humility and the dependence down to the core before he dares bring out the good stuff. And don't be hyper-minded in your thinking, but be literally saved-minded. Think like a saved person. Yes, I once but was lost. I was born onto a corrupt rootstock, which made a twisted, corrupt tree. But I have been transplanted and grafted over to the living rootstock of Jesus. And he is transforming me from the inside out. And he's going to make me good to the core. He's going to make me well-pleasing. He's going to make me complete. That's being saved-minded is recognizing that life to its fullest is found in full dependence on the one who is life. Think save-mindedly. As God, as to each one, God has divided measure of faith. And this is where we closed last week. Life in this world is not fair. Some people are privileged in certain ways and others are underprivileged in the same ways. Some people have more talents, some less. Some have more opportunities, some less. Some are born into wealth, some are born into poverty. Some are born into solid homes and some are born into broken messes of homes. Some are born with good health, some are born with lousy health. Some will live a long life, some will live a short and painful life. Life is not fair. But Paul says, from an eternal perspective, life is fair. Because God has divided, like he divided the fish, he has divided 
to each one measure of faith. He has given each of us what it is necessary to get out of this world alive. And 10 seconds into eternity, your circumstances on this earth will not matter. You have an eternity ahead where life is phenomenal. What is that measure of faith? Well, he doesn't tell us here what that size is, but what did Jesus say? If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can transplant a mulberry tree into the sea and it will obey. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, be moved somewhere else and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. If in Jesus, you are given that mustard seed measure of faith, everyone, no matter your circumstances of birth, your environment that you're raised in, your, what you grow up in, if everyone has that measure of faith and can plant it, and it will become a tree that will blossom and grow into eternity. And nothing will be impossible. That evens it up for everyone. Stop complaining about your circumstances and plant the seed. It'll grow. The world tells you that you need to add up all the intersections of disadvantage that you have and somehow demand your equality. It'll never work in a world of sin. But if you plant the seed God's given you, it'll take you out of here alive into a glorious eternity. And that's all that really matters. If you manage to even the score in this world, but don't plant your seed, you're on a dead end. And if in this world, you never have what most people have, be it wealth or freedom or power or fame or pleasure, but you plant the seed, you're gonna get out of here alive. And that's all that matters. We have a different perspective on justice and social issues because we recognize we're never going to even the score here. We must do our best to help one another, but life is going to be unfair. But let's plant the seed and grow together. And let's get out of here alive into eternity and take as many people with us as we can. If you can't set them free or give them wealth or give them fairness or even the score, but you can give them Jesus and get them out of here alive, it'll be okay. So Paul makes an interesting shift now. In verses 1 to 3, he's talking about individual stuff. You become a living sacrifice. You be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is your logical worship of God. You don't be hyper-minded, but be saved-minded. You recognize you've been given the measure of faith and plant it. So you can experience life. And then in verse 4, he just shifts from the individual to the corporate. For as many as our members, for, for as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Paul's talking about you and I being transformed. God making us good and well-pleasing and complete. And us becoming saved-minded, plant the seed, bury it, living sacrifice. It will grow, graft, abide. He will transform. He's talking about a very personal thing that happens to us absolutely individually. You can't save somebody else and somebody else can't save you. You have to decide whether you're going to be the living sacrifice and let God transform you. And then all of a sudden he shifts to 
for as we have many members but in one body. All of a sudden he says, whoops, you're not the only sprout on the eternal roots. Everybody gets grafted into those eternal roots. And you're one branch on a great tree with many, many branches. But yet your branch is unique from all the other branches. So it's like a body. As we have many members, parts of our body, they don't all have the same function. You know, over in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, what if everyone was a foot? Wouldn't be much of a body. What if everyone was a hand? Wouldn't have any feet. You know. uh, what if everybody was a mouth? I think that may be true. Because um, James says, if you control your mouth, you are sanctified. You're holy. Many members in one body, but all members don't have the same function. So evidently, Paul intends to tell us that when we let God transform us, he's not only going to make us incredible, he's going to make us function. So we being many are one body in Christ. There's only one tree, but there are a lot of branches and individually members of one another. What is this body of Christ? Colossians 1.15, a great passage on Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. Want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. If you stumble over the Old Testament stories, look at Jesus. Put on your Jesus glasses when you read the scriptures. He's the firstborn over all creation. He's the premier birth and the premier resurrection. As he was born holy, he will rebirth us holy. As he raised, so we will be raised. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, each in its own order. Christ the first fruit, afterward those who are his at his coming. He's the firstborn over all creation. For by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him. Paul doesn't leave any options out. If it exists, Jesus made it. He's the creator. John 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So Paul says Jesus is, want to see what God looks like? Look at Jesus. He's the premier birth. He's the premier resurrection. He is the creator of all things. That's why he can recreate you and me. If Jesus is not eternal God and creator, then he can't do what he says he will do. Because to recreate takes the same power as creation. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. He predates all things, which has to be logically because he made all things, right? you got to be around before he can make something. And in him all things consist. We are not self-generating and we are not self-sustaining human beings. None of creation is. If God's power were not fueling the universe, the universe would cease to exist. So the idea that we live a life of desperate dependence on God is not God keeping us in a lowly dependent position. It's recognizing physical reality. We live in a world today that does not want to recognize physical reality. And God says the reality is I am life. You get your life from me. If you go independent of me, which Eve tried to do at the tree, Going independent of God is going independent of life. 
And when you go independent of life, you're dead. So God doesn't kill sinners. Sin will kill you. The choice to sin is the choice to be independent, which is the choice to try to live apart from life, which doesn't work. He's before all things, and in him all things consist. In him we live and move and have our being. And this is where we're headed. He is the head of the body. Now let's see, it says, the body has many members, they don't have the same function. We being many are one body in Christ. By the way, that's the only place we'll become one, otherwise we're fractured, right? One body in Christ, individually members of one another, and Luke 1, Verse 18, I mean, Colossians, where did I get Luke? Colossians 1.18 says he is the head of the body. And that body is the church. Oh, dear. Do you like the church? I've known people that don't like the church. I've gotten annoyed at the church. I've wondered what the church was up to. And of course, one of the problems with that is I'm thinking often of the church as some institution. Nowhere in the New Testament is the word church used to apply to a building. We call this the church. Now, this is the building. This is the meeting hall. This is the place of assembly. Nowhere does the word church, is the word church in the New Testament applied to a meeting. We're having church. No, we're having a worship service. The word church is always and only applied to people. We are the church. So I may get annoyed or whatever, things that various parts of the institution may do, and therefore I think I'm annoyed at the church. The only way I can be annoyed at the church is if I'm annoyed at you, because you're the church. I may be annoyed at the institutional hierarchy. I may be annoyed at what some committees do or don't do. I have to remember, the church is only and always the people. We are the church. Now, here is a reality. If you're in Christ, you're in the church. It doesn't matter whether you want to be in the church or you don't want to be in the church. It doesn't matter whether you like the church or you don't like the church. If you're in Christ... You're in the church because he's the head of the body, which is the church. So get over it, accept it, be part of the church. You can claim you aren't part of the church. You're still part of the church. So when we become a living sacrifice, we're grafted onto God's living rootstock. And he transforms us from the inside out. A reality is we're just one branch of many that have been grafted into that rootstock. And that tree is called the church. Down in verse 24, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up my, in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. So we, we got this down now. The body of which we are part of when we're grafted into Christ is the church. So becoming that living sacrifice and being transformed is a individual personal experience that happens in community. God is transforming you 
but he transforms you as part of all the rest that he's transforming. And by the way, that's necessary because the most important part of your sanctification is your relationship with other people. If there's nobody else on earth to relate to, you don't need nearly as much sanctification. The author John Eldridge says marriage is God's main means of our sanctification. And if you've been married more than five minutes, you probably understand that. It's as we live in, uh, I almost want to say murderous closeness. <laughs> as we live in that, uh, where we just have to interact with other people on a constant ongoing basis and they don't go away. We don't want them to go away, but sometimes we want them to go away. You know what I mean? It's that interrelational interaction that actually is what God uses for our sanctification. You know, 45 years into marriage, am I still treating my wife the same way I was 45 years ago? And what I mean by that is, ha ha not only am I treating her better, but have my issues been rounded out a bit? The rough corner's knocked off. Am I a kinder, better person? Do I put up with her issues better than I did 45 years ago? Does she put up with mine? Have we been transformed or have we just been fighting, right? Those are the questions we have to ask. And then it didn't happen to us, but for most of you, God brings children. Now that'll knock some rough edges off, right? They'll teach you how selfish you are really fast. God will start. God will keep. It's glory to glory. Every time I heard this this week on, I, I cleaned out my office so Zach could have it, and I found lots of, CDs that I had no idea what was on them. So I got a stack at home, and when I'm working at my desk, I stick one in to see what it is. Depending on what it is, it goes in the trash or it goes somewhere else. I put one in a couple nights ago. Some guy preaching a sermon. I don't, well, I know the name, and I looked up something online to see who he was. But he said, every time God makes a change in you, it's always an upgrade. So why are you fighting the changes? You know, well, God's really working on this area in my life. We're struggling through, you know. We're, wait a minute. Give up. He's making an upgrade. Let it happen. Don't fight it. It doesn't always feel like an upgrade. But if God's doing it, it's an upgrade. i got to listen to that sermon one more time. That's the one piece I got out of it. If you're a hermit on an island and there's no other person around, you don't need nearly as much sanctification as when you're in a group of people. A lot of which in the church, the only reason we cross paths is because of Jesus. We would not normally like each other. We would not normally be attracted to each other. We would not normally have any reason or desire to hang out with each other. But man, we were grafted right next to that person, and there they are. And their leaves and their fruit are all around ours. So I find it interesting how Paul moves from that individual transformation experience of death and resurrection and grafting and abiding and transformation and planting the seed of faith to say, and guess what? That puts you in the church. That puts you in a group of a whole bunch of other people that you didn't choose, you know? We say we can choose our friends, but we can't choose our relatives. You don't get to choose your spiritual relatives. 
We're stuck with each other. And we're the church. First Corinthians 12, 27, the other passage where Paul deals with this same stuff, with the same illustrations. You are the body of Christ and members individually. Becoming the body of Christ does not homogenize you as an impersonal part of the great cosmic whole. That's Eastern religion. Being grafted into the body of Christ makes you more of the unique person God intended you to be. He strips off the fig leaves that make us all look the same as we hide behind those fig leaves. And he actually develops the real you. That can be scary, but he says, trust me, I know what I'm doing. So the word for church is the word ecclesia. Ek is where we get the English word exit. You can see it over every door here in the sanctuary, exit means out, this is the way out. And klesia is a noun or adjectival form of the verb to call, kaleo. So it's interesting, the word church, we actually get from, I think, the Latin or something, kirche or something, maybe that's the German version. But the word in the Bible is actually ecclesia. We're the called out. I joined the called out. Right? Mary Barbo joined the called out today, or at least this version of it. We're the called out. Called out of what? Called out of death into life. Called out of sin into salvation. Called out of twisted selfishness into the glory of Christ from glory to glory. And it's a word that we generally think of as New Testament, the church. So I saw a couple of interesting things. Jesus says, on this rock, I'll build my church. He was talking to his disciples, probably speaking of himself. That's the first mention in the New Testament of Ecclesia. Whose church is it? It's not my church, not your church. It's Jesus' church. I will build my church. In our morning devotionals that I've been I do one or two a week if you watch those. Um, I've been going through, just finished going through the seven churches. Took, you know, 10 weeks or so of little eight minute segments. And you know, one church has lost its love, but it's still his church. One church is, is persecuted, it's still his church. One church is compromised, it's still his church. One church is flat out corrupt, Thyatira. It's still his church. One church claims to be alive, but it's really dead. It's still his church. One church actually has it all together, Philadelphia. It's still his church. And then there's those lazy Laodiceans, and they're still, though they're nauseating, they're lukewarm. They're not bad, but they're not good. They're still his church. You know what that means? We're still his church. We're not all we should be, but we're still his church. And you're not going to purify the church. He will. By purifying you individually while you're connected to the church. Individual salvation happens in a corporate family setting. Interestingly enough, um, Acts 7, verse 38, Stephen, in his last sermon before the Sanhedrin, before they killed him, said, this is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. Speaking of Moses, guess what that word congregation is? Ecclesia. There was a church before the church. If you use the Greek, 
the congregation of the children of Israel in the Greek is the ecclesia. They were called out of Egypt to go to Canaan. They were called out of slavery into freedom. Hebrews quotes Psalm 22, 22, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the church, ecclesia, I will sing praise to you. And if you go to the Septuagint Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was translated a couple hundred years before Christ, and is what the New Testament writers quoted from when they quote the Old Testament in the New, it's almost always word for word from the Septuagint. So it was authoritative in the minds of the disciples. They used it as the word of God. And when it speaks of the assembly of the children of Israel, it calls them the ecclesia. God has always had a church. His people are the church. Whether they're looking forward to Messiah coming, Old Testament, or whether they're looking back that he came, New Testament, we're still the church. We're the called out ones. Now, just to stretch your brain, there's one other very interesting use of the word church in the New Testament, which can help us understand what the church is. Remember in Ephesus when Demetrius, the silversmith, started a riot? He said this Paul guy is turning people away from the great Diana of the Ephesians, of which we make her shrines and you buy them and it makes us rich. And he's actually causing people to no longer revere Diana, so they no longer want to buy our shrines, which makes us rich. It's all about economics. It's never about God. And so he gathers a crowd, and they, they shout for two hours in the forum. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And finally, well, it says they cried some one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them didn't know why they had come together. And guess what that word assembly is? Church. Ecclesia. So when the people in Ephesus got together for a riot, that was the church. That was, they used the word church for that. Yeah. So an assembly of people was known as called out into, from individuality into the group. And of course, the, uh, the leader of the town, the magistrate, got up and said, if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in a lawful church, <laughs> a lawful assembly. For we're in danger of being called into question for today's uproar. They did not have freedom of association. There being no reason which we may give account for this or disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the church. <laughs> I just, I, I laugh at that because I realize the word church isn't a unique word just for God's people getting together. It's pretty much a word for any time any people get together for a purpose. So we're not just the church people. We're the church of Jesus Christ. We're not the church of the legal lawful assembly for a courtroom. We're not the church of a group of people gathered in the forum to shout for Diana of the Ephesians. We're the church of Christ. We've been called out of that church. <laughs> We've been called into the true church of Jesus Christ. And when we become that living sacrifice, when we let ourselves die and be grafted in. When we abide in Jesus, when we're letting him transform us individually, he's also doing it as a group. We're branches on a tree with many grafts. All those grafts go directly into Jesus. But we're branches on a great tree. And we're stuck with each other, whether we like each other or not. Because we're in Christ and sanctification as he makes us holy and complete and well-pleasing. I like that. If we stick with Jesus and let him transform us, we're actually going to end up liking each other. 
Isn't that good? Yeah. Well, it should become a family that likes each other. He's going to make us holy, complete, well-pleasing, good to the core. So, in Christ, when we become that living sacrifice, when we are grafted in, the moment we die and are grafted, we're cut off and grafted, we are saved. The finished work of salvation has just begun. <laughs> I know that makes no sense, but you got to think that way. The finished work, I'm saved, of salvation. I've just begun to experience it. Secondly, transformation is going to happen. Not to get me saved, but because I am saved. Not to make me saved, but to cause me to begin to experience saved. Just as you got married, so you could experience marriage. You came to life, so you could experience life. You get saved, so you can experience saved or salvation. Number one, I have been saved. Number two, I am being saved. But that saved Experience takes us into community. The third dimension is community. We get grafted onto a great tree with many branches, and we're stuck with each other, whether we like each other or not, because we're the church. You don't get to decide if you want to be in the church. If you're in Christ, he is the head of the body, which is the church. So, so far, Paul's given us three dimensions. Salvation, full and complete, which is just the beginning of experiencing transformation, which is going to go on forever from glory to glory to glory. And it's all going to happen in community with each other. You know, you can, you can kind of get where the, even how God lined up the resurrection with the exception of Moses and Elijah and Enoch, we're all going to go up in community. He doesn't take you at one point and me at another, but we're all going to come up and be trans, uh, translated. Be the corruptible will put on incorruption. We're going to be trans. The transformation will be finished in the moment in the twinkling of an eye in terms of the end of any negatives, and we will together all go to the party at the same time. The individual experience of salvation happens in community, and that community will go on forever. Now, there is a fourth dimension to this picture, and that will be next week. See you back then. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for salvation. And often that's where we stop. I've been saved. Great. It is wonderful. But I want to thank you for transformation. I want to thank you for making it possible for me to begin to live now and to experience forever and ever the wonders of being made more and more like Jesus. Thank you that you saved me, saved me, past tense, so that you can be saving me, present tense. And Lord, I, I, sometimes we're not so thankful about this, but I want to thank you that you save us into your body, which is the church, into community. Because as you transform us and make us good to the core and well-pleasing and complete, the joy of our experience in you will be most fully discovered and experienced in our relationship of love, not only with you, number one, the first great commandment, but with each other, the second great commandment. As we are transformed, formed into your likeness, 
we will more and more love each other to the point where you were able to tell the disciples. This is how people will be able to tell you're my disciples, because of your love for one another. So thank you for the church. Thank you for the community. Thank you for the transformation that can make the community a joy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.